Well, let's see if this is working. Can you hear me? The, the audio is working? Everybody settled in? I keep talking. How's that for the volume? Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you everyone for coming to this, the first event of the Trinity Spiritual Center programming season. And I can't even believe that as our first opportunity to gather, we are graced by the presence of Sadhvi Bhagavati Saraswati, who um, is one of the great spiritual leaders of our day. Um, and it's uh, such an honor to have you here with us tonight, Sadhvi. I, uh, I was watching the video, the promotional video, and thinking, wow, you know, the Dalai Lama, Pope Francis, <laughs> Prince Charles, and Camilla. And she's coming here <laughs> to the Lake Wobegon of Connecticut. Um, so <laughs> but um, if, we're going to have a wonderful time with you. And I can't wait to dive into our conversation. I thought that maybe instead of going through a, a very long um, introduction, um, we would skip that um, because we hope to discuss all the many things that you have done in your life, all the accomplishments as we get through the evening. And so I, I think maybe we'll just dive in, um, but let me first uh, just address some sort of housekeeping issues for the evening. Um, the format tonight will be that we will spend about 30 minutes in conversation. I have a, a set of questions that I'd love to um, ask Sadhvi based on uh, her book, uh, the, the memoir, From Hollywood to the Himalayas, um, or Himalayas, I guess is how it's said. Uh, and, then, and then we will open up um, the room to Q&A for about 20 minutes. And then Sadhvi has, um, has agreed to open up the space, hold open a space for us to meditate together for about 10 minutes. And I thought that would be an interesting way for us to also encounter um, her presence. Um, and, and, make, and there isn't often an opportunity for us to, to do something like that. So um, I wanna make sure that we reserve a little bit of time for that. And then at the end, um, Sabi has agreed to uh, sign books. So this writing desk will come down here. Um, and, and anyone who has purchased a book or would like to purchase one afterwards will have the opportunity to have it signed. Um, so I think with that, oh, and bathrooms. Um, as the bathrooms, if you haven't uh, discovered, there's one there, there's one on the other side of this hall, and then there's a couple bathrooms up the stairs. So plenty of, um, plenty of uh, facilities. So. So I think what I would like to do to start um, this conversation is to, um, is to really kind of explore your life before India, because in so many ways, um, it resembles uh, a lot of the experience that we have had here um, in, in, in Fairfield County. And you, you grew up in a big metropolitan area, Los Angeles. You, uh, you were surrounded by a great deal of affluence, um, a tremendous amount of emphasis on material uh, success. Um, you subjected yourself to the sort of the academic pressures that go along with being in that environment and succeeded in uh, graduating from Stanford and pursuing a PhD. Um, and I thought what was really interesting uh, was that you, uh, you sort of entered life um, sort of brought up within the Jewish tradition, but, um, but not particularly religious. Um, and so I just felt like it would be interesting to have you share a bit of your experience, the good and the bad, um, so that we can sort of have this sense that your journey could actually be 
perhaps one that we might encounter too. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm so, so happy to be with you all this evening. It's, it's such a beautiful space, both the church itself, the center itself, as well as the area outside. It was raining when our train arrived from New York, which as I told Mark, in, in India, the rain is very auspicious. So whenever it rains, it's considered a beautiful, a beautiful blessing. My life growing up was really, it was one in which from the outside looking in, you would say, this girl, or as I got older, this young woman has everything. I literally grew up in Hollywood, in, in the Hollywood Hills, went to school with actors and actresses and children of actors and actresses and children of directors and producers and was allowed to cut school every once in a while when something really fun was happening on a movie set that somebody I knew was doing and mom would let me go and do that for a day as though you know, being on the set of Grease 2 with Michelle Pfeiffer counted as, counted as an academic educational experience. <laughs> but I mean, it's great because for a mom to actually know that chances are, as my life went on, that was going to have much more of an impact than whatever we were learning in seventh grade that day, actually showed such a level of foresight. So, yeah, I literally grew up in that world. And it was a world of opportunity. It was a world of great privilege. And it was a world in which we had everything that in our culture that is so anchored and rooted in materialism that we're told one needs to be happy. You need to have a lot of money, have a house in the right area of town, go to the right school, vacation at the right resorts, wear the right clothes, look the right way in the right clothes, have the right size waist, have, I mean, it was just all of that. And we were what I, what I now call happy by default, meaning it wasn't that we were walking around miserable, that if you had stopped any of us in the middle of lunch period or recess and said, how are you? We would have said, well, God, you know, I'm really struggling with feelings of inadequacy. I mean, we would have said, oh, great. Like, you know, the person I wanted to have lunch with had lunch with me today, and I got into my jeans, and look how cute I look in them, and, you know, we were happy by default, as in here are the things that we were told we need to be happy. We had those things, and therefore we just assumed we were happy. And at that age, the necessity of turning to drugs, alcohol, food, sex, shopping, we didn't have Facebook at that time, but if we did, that would have been on the list, to, to ease the internal pain, to ease the internal struggle, to ease the internal conflict. We weren't aware that that was something that didn't really work. We weren't aware that the need to have something numb us from the internal experience was a signal that something was wrong. Now, in my case, I had been through quite significant trauma in my early childhood and had carried that into my adolescence in a way that seemed to work for me, meaning turning to, in my case, 
food, but sometimes drugs, sometimes alcohol, sometimes shopping, sometimes sex, sort of whatever the thing of the moment was, to not feel the pain that I was feeling on the inside. Because what we were told and taught was when you have stress, when you have conflict, when you have struggle, oh, here's this substance that you can have and feel better. And some of it was the culture. Some of it was advertising. I mean, you pick up any magazine, you look at any billboard, you see any TV commercial, and what they tell you is who you are is not enough. And if you buy my product, then you will be enough. And it doesn't matter what we sell, and I won't spend too much time here on the science of marketing, but the bottom line of marketing is in order to sell us something, they have to first convince us that there is something wrong with us and that that wrongness, that inadequacy, will be filled by changing our brand of soap, changing our brand of shampoo, having a different car, buying a different brand of jeans, that if only I drove that car, I too would be driving into the sunset with my hair flowing in the wind free and I wouldn't be stuck in this stupid traffic. And that's the teaching that we get. So in any case, by the age of 25, as Mark said, I had graduated from Stanford. I was succeeding phenomenally in a PhD program. I was getting straight A's in 21 units a quarter and really, really excelling. And in my mind, the fact that I had learned to manage my life, that I had learned to manage my pain, manage my reaction to the trauma I had experienced, manage my addiction, manage my stress, manage my relationships, that that was as good as it got. I mean, everybody I knew was somewhere on the spectrum of managing their lives, either managing well or not managing well. But no one ever said, oh, and by the way, there's actually something more. Actually, by the way, white knuckling your way through the world, micromanaging everything, in order to stay in control and feel okay, to keep everything around you just so, so that you don't have to feel the pain, so that you don't have to feel the struggle, so that you don't have to feel the suffering. I had no idea that there was actually an alternative to just managing one's life, that we actually could be could be free of that and actually be vehicles and vessels and tools and instruments of the divine flow here on earth, open and expanded and present. So what I think is so interesting, Kelly, is that you, know, you, you paint a picture of a person that I think we can all relate to and which we all in some ways have the same, uh, the, the same dynamics going on. Um, and you take that because your husband at the time, uh, Jim, uh, uh, suggests that you, you know, take, a, take the fall off. Come with me, travel. You've traveled with him before, you know. Let's go to India because he was actually the, the, the spiritual pra uh, practitioner in the family. You know, he was the one going to the ashrams and, and uh, you had no interest. It's a, as I understand it, the, the thing that finally sold you on going to India was the food. <laughs> <laughs> That's what got you there. Um, and so let's skip to this, this moment when you, you, he finally convinces you to take the term off and, and, and you end up in, uh, and there's a lot of adventures in the book, so I, and I'm not gonna repeat them because it would spoil everything, but, but um, you end up in Rishikesh. Um, and um, and he, he leaves you to go check out all the ashrams and find a guru and kind of settle into that. And you're just 
walking around, um, checking things out like any tourist does. And then what happens? Yeah, and then <laughs> I stood on the banks of the sacred Ganga River. And as Mark said, I was not on a spiritual path. I was definitely not religious, but I also was not one of those people who say, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I was an academic, I was a scientist. And on a deep level that I only realize in retrospect, because of the trauma I had experienced, I felt like there was something inherently wrong with me, something inherently dark and not right in me, and that somehow I was not worthy of grace, spirituality, that connection to the divine. And again, this was not part of my awareness at the time. It's only something in retrospect I can look back and recognize. But at the time, I was a 25-year-old student taking you know, 21 units a quarter, a hardcore academic, scientist, studying neurology, and. So the lack of a spiritual life was never something that felt like a lack. I had plenty going on. My husband did the spiritual thing. It was clear that was his thing, not mine. And so there we are in Rishikesh. I stood on the banks of the Ganga River, what we call the Ganges River here, not even knowing that the river was holy. And I had this extraordinary experience of connection to the perfection in the universe, the divine perfection in the universe, and an awareness that I was part of that. That here was the divine outside of me and inside of me, that there no longer was an outside or an inside. It didn't matter what I was looking at, whether it was the river, whether it was a child, whether it was a family, whether it was a tree. It began when I was looking at the river. But as I started to turn my head, it stayed. And whatever I saw was just infused with the presence of God and was not separate from me. I was infused with the presence of God. I was one with the divine. Not by any religious sense, it wasn't, oh, now I have become some other religion, or even now I have experienced God in some particular religious form. It was just the presence of an infinite divinity. That because it's infinite, was everywhere, including in me. And it rendered me, knocked me to the ground. I was crying. And it rendered me pretty nonverbal for many days. And pretty much all I could say for days was, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. As the tears just streamed down my face. It was just, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Because I, who had never trusted myself, had never trusted the universe, suddenly, with no expectation, with no intention, without even consciously seeking, had just been given this experience of the presence of God and the perfection of the divine. And that that was in me and as me, and in and as everyone and everything. And it was transformative, to say the least. And it led to, as Mark said, we won't spoil all the fun adventures in the book, but it led to, over the next seven, ten days, me having a series of experiences. of being touched by the divine in ways that I, in order to, <laughs> in order to know that I wasn't going crazy, I had to have faith. 
And so it was like in that moment I was given. I was given the faith that I never had had, but that was absolutely necessary in order to then walk through the next seven to 10 days of all of these incredible experiences of hearing a voice, of getting my feet glued to the ground, of, I mean, so many different things that otherwise I would have said, impossible, no way. Somebody's drugged you, you've gone crazy. But in that experience of the presence of God, all of the faith, the awareness of that perfection was there. And so I was able to keep my heart open as all of these incredible experiences started happening that made me know this is where you're supposed to be. Mm. And I think one of the things that was so interesting in the book that... Um that really got my attention was that the experiences, you tried to understand the experiences using your scientific brain to explain all the phenomenon in one way or another and, and did not succeed. That it was just, it was something that just kind of completely defied all, um, all of the tools that yes. you had so carefully developed in, in order to uh, understand your reality. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's, it's interesting because as you can imagine, one of the topics that I have been blessed to be called upon to speak about quite frequently is that intersection of science and spirituality. Sure. And for me, they actually overlap beautifully. I am still a scientist. I love science. There is nothing I have experienced spiritually that has made me any less of an avid scientist. But what it has made me realize is that science simply needs to understand where its jurisdiction begins and ends. And that it is fantastic when you're looking at a phenomenon that science has developed a tool for. If it's something that can be put in a beaker melted on a Bunsen burner, you know, weighed on a scale, seen by a telescope or a microscope, we're all good, science is all over it. But if it's something that can't, science doesn't have the tools yet to understand it, and that's fine. Nobody ever said science has to understand everything. The dilemma is when we assume that it does, and when we assume that any phenomena that can't fit into a beaker, or be measured with a tape measure, or a scale, or seen by a microscope or a telescope, somehow doesn't exist. Yeah. It would render love a figment of all of our imaginations. Forget God. Try, try convincing someone that you love them using weights and measures. Right, I love you, 66 pounds worth. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so what I've, what I've realized over the years is that the tools that spiritual sages, saints, yogis, rishis, incarnations, prophets, whatever word we use to think about those beings who have come onto earth and have given us wisdom that is timeless. The tools they were using were the inner tools, the inner tools of knowing. Whereas science's tools keep changing. And so, for example, a couple hundred years ago, if in school you had said the earth is flat and everything revolves around it, you would have gotten an A+. Plus. That was true. Well, obviously we know it wasn't true, but by the tools that we had at that time, the earth was flat and everything revolved around it. And as tools changed, so did the truth. We now have tools that tell us the earth is round and actually we're revolving and everything's, 
But who knows whether 200 years from now they're going to look back and be like, ha, 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 those people thought the earth was drowned. Isn't that funny? Right. We don't know, and that's okay. As long as we don't then deny phenomena right. that can't be measured by science. Right. Just which because I we tried can't to do. measure it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Exactly. It just means we can't measure it. Exactly. So it's interesting that that's a good segue then into the next sort of set of events in the in the memoir, which is that, um, and again I won't spoil it because this is a truly hilarious part of the book, um, how it happens that you um, come to the realization that you literally must stay. <laughs> you can't yes. leave yes. Brashikesh, yes. um, and that comes. That's a really fun um, piece, but. So ultimately, you actually do end up going into and meeting the president of the ashram um, in one of the ashrams in Rishikesh. Um, and after much pleading, because you know you have to stay, um, he agrees to let you, um, which is highly unusual, I would think, um, to let an American woman um, become part of the community. And not only does he take you in, but then he, he gives you work, Seva, to, yes. to undertake. Um, and that work um, is actually working by his side, closely with him, um, in an administrative capacity on a, a wealth of projects. With, you know, now, this is one of the great spiritual leaders in India that you are now daily, when he's there, you know, hourly. Yeah. It, in, in interacting with. And there's a moment in the book, which I think it's really important that we talk about for a little bit, which is you're not understanding the language, you know, um, and yet you're hearing, participating in um, the rituals and the prayers and um, the meditation practices that are, um, that are offered in, in the ashram. And it, you, you make a really important point that even though you didn't understand the words and perhaps because you didn't, mm -hmm. um, you were moved yeah. by the music. Yes. And that, that there's something about these, these traditions, these rituals that are so powerful. It's like any great piece of music. Yes. It touches you and, and transforms you. Um, and that then led to you know, sort of these sort of adopting and going deep mm -hmm. into this tradition yes. with this spiritual leader at your side. So, I mean, that must have just been. It yeah. was extraordinary. I mean, the whole thing was just grace. You know, as we, as we played around with titles for the book, there kept coming up options that had the word grace in it. And of course, it was suggested then by the publishers not to use the word grace because it could get, it could get confused with the way that it's used in other traditions. And so we didn't, but nonetheless, that doesn't change the reality of the fact that to me, it just was grace. There was no way for me to understand it logically. Here I had been given this extraordinary opportunity to live in the ashram, given this extraordinary opportunity to do service. And the other funny piece about that is I was a PhD student. And on the first day when I asked him, and as Mark said, he's not just the head of the ashram I wanted to stay in. He's one of the most revered spiritual leaders in India and in the world. I mean, he's, he's the one who gets called to represent India, Hinduism, at the United Nations, at the World Bank, at the Parliament of Religions, at the World Economic Forum. Wherever he goes in India, people are, are falling at his feet, which I didn't know. When I first met him, I had no idea. I mean, I was in the middle of this spiritual intoxication. It never would have occurred to me to say, oh, and by the way, do you travel abroad? <laughs> like it, was, it was an irrelevancy. 
he was this almost magical being in this magical place who was just exuding love and grace. And what he did in the world was just irrelevant to me. And I, I didn't know, I never asked, it never would have occurred to me to ask. And I, I only came to know when he was telling someone something about me, and it was in Hindi, and so I didn't understand, but I understood Stanford. It was like Hindi, 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 Stanford, Hindi, 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 Hindi. And I was like, that's so weird. How does he even know what Stanford is? I had no idea that he had ever been in America, that he was this great world leader. And so when I asked him if there was something I could do, the first thing he asked me was, can you type? <laughs> and it was so sweet because I was a PhD student. I was like, yeah, I can type. And as a student, I, unfortunately, I mean, I wish I could redo all of those years because it's so fascinating to me in retrospect, but at the time, my only goal was get this thing over. I wanted to get straight A's. That mattered to me. But it was never about actually being a sincere student or learning the material. For me, my MO was always, what's the bare minimum I need to do to get the grade I want? And so I was always a procrastinator, always, you know, the night before an exam, I was up all night. And, and then he gives me seva to do. And in the beginning, he obviously didn't know how long I was going to be there. He wasn't going to hand me some massive project. I couldn't have taken it on anyway. So I was doing correspondence, you know, it was the days of letters, and he was getting letters, and I would come and he would give me letters and what to say to whom. And, and I was so ecstatic. I would sit in that office, oh, and I didn't, not only didn't I have a computer, but it was many weeks, it may have been months, I don't remember, before I even got an electric typewriter. They were working on manual typewriters. I had a typewriter the color of your shirt, with the, the things that, I mean, you literally, it was, <laughs> it was like this, and it was white out if you made a mistake. And I was exuberant. Early morning, I wanted to get started, till late at night, like every day I wanted to finish everything I had been given. And I remember thinking, this is so funny, because where I couldn't generate the energy or the excitement, the passion, to actually learn what I was studying in school, here I was exuberant to be writing letters to people I had never met, would never meet, didn't know in random parts of the world about all sorts of random things. You know, he would be invited to things, people wanted blessings, we, there were projects going on, they needed his answers. And it was so fulfilling, and it was where I learned that power of service, that it wasn't about the what you're doing. It was about the why you're doing it, and the for whom you're doing it. And that everything else I had been doing, the why was to get an A. Or to have the top grade in the class, or to finally finish this course. For whom? For myself, for my ego. I want to have the top grade in the class. And when you shift that into why, to serve, to be a vehicle of service, you know, as, as St. Francis of Assisi says in my favorite prayer, O Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And through these little letters, I was able to bring peace and joy to the people who would receive them by getting his blessings or getting his answer. And then as the, as the work increased and expanded, 
it just became this incredible blessing to be able to serve. So yeah, it was, it was inconceivable to me how it happened. It just was grace. And to be able to have that level of interaction with a being, an awakened, enlightened being who just is love and is divinity and is grace, to be in that presence was so powerful and to be to be loved, not because of the physical body that I was. There's actually a part in the book, I don't know if you were going to mention it, but there's actually a part in the book when I realized that I had a really big crush on him. <laughs> and I was 25, he was 45. And as a young woman, pretty much my interaction with the world was as a physical body. And, you know, with your friends, it was always a matter of comparing how everybody looked and whatnot. And with men, there was just always an awareness that that was the presence that I, that I brought, was a physical body, a, a sexual, sensual being. Now, I had experienced sexual abuse in early childhood. So A, part of it is the just growing up in Hollywood aspect of it. B, was the carrying of that childhood piece into it. But I was really acutely aware of the fact that in my mind, my worthiness in the world, my value in the world had to do with what I brought to the moment on a physical level. And so as I was showered with this, this just presence of love, of grace, of opportunity to be in his presence, I misread it. I thought, oh, this is gonna go someplace fun. And when I realized that not only was that not what he intended, but regardless of how available I made myself, neither did he want it, nor did he even notice. I mean, I finally realized that I literally could walk into the office stark naked and he wouldn't notice. Unless it were the winter, at which point he would ring the bell and tell one of his boys to bring me a shawl lest I catch cold. And as a young woman, to be given love, to be given opportunity, to be given this ability to be in the presence of without literally wanting anything in return, even when it's offered, other than that being to evolve, that being to get close to God, was in and of itself a transformative experience because it literally forced me. I mean, in the beginning, it was really difficult. And then it forced me to actually see myself in a way that I never had seen myself before. What do you mean there's something of value in me that isn't my body? What do you mean I have something of value that isn't as a sexual object or as a sensual object or as someone who's going to do something for you? And that was a huge transformation. So I want to check in with everybody because we are running a little bit longer than, um, but I want to make sure that if you have questions, um, you feel um, that you have the opportunity to ask them. Um, and so uh, please feel free to come up to the center mic so that we know that you might have a question. Um, I will continue to ask because I've got, I'm a two-year-old, I would ask questions forever. Um, things that I would love to hear you talk about sure. um, for a few more minutes and then we will move into the meditation. Um, but I think one of the things that was um, really interesting, I mean, this part of this, uh, this 
this narrative that is, um, is so extraordinary that it's, it's sort of hard to imagine how um, we as individuals um, could have uh, a similar experience because we obviously don't have Puja Swajini, Swamiji in our, uh, in our life, right? Um, but uh, one of the things that I really love about the book is that you break down the um, a ser sort of the, the lessons that unfolded in your journey. I mean, you had the benefit of having um, this um, spiritual leader by your side to help you work through those lessons. Um, but they're lessons that I think we all um, encounter one way or another on our own journey. Um, and I, as, I, as I was reading the book, it's like I was struck by sort of the sense of familiarity. <laughs> of, of, um, and I want to make sure that we actually talk a little bit about how um, much your experience is actually um, available to Excellent. all of us, um, you know, in our own way, because the divine is all around us. Yes. We just don't necessarily have, we haven't created the space, to, you know, the openness for grace to enter in. And that's, the, that's really the, the journey. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and that's what's been so interesting and fun for me with the book because of course there's, there's two, two arcs of the book, two parallel arcs. One is the arc of my spiritual adventure. The quite literal Hollywood to the Himalayas journey. The struggle and the pain that I went into that with. The way that I was taught to let go, to forgive, the experiences I had, the ecstasy, the expansion, the challenges, the difficulties, the funny parts, the you know, sad parts, whatever it may be, all of that. That spiritual adventure. But then there's the second arc. And the second arc is the shift in thought. And that is an arc that is available to everyone, regardless of what your physical arc may be. Most of us move through the world with what I think of as a Hollywood way of thinking. Meaning, we identify ourselves based on this, this body, its size, its shape, its color, where it's been, what has happened to it, what it does, how much money it gets paid for what it does, therefore how large its bank account or its pockets may be. The beings with which with whom it interacts, our relationships. And we identify as that. So if I say, who are you? You're going to give me a name, an age, a where you're from, a where you live, a title, a career, maybe some relationships, so-and-so's mother, so-and-so's father, so-and-so's wife, so-and-so's husband. Maybe you're going to give me parts of your past, depending on how you feel they impacted you. A survivor of this, an achiever of that, a failure at this, a success at that, the CEO of this, the president of that. That's the Hollywood way. That's who we are, this physical body. And the dilemma with that is it causes suffering. In the, in the Vedic tradition, we don't speak about sin. We speak about ignorance. And that, that which we do, which would be considered sinful, 
is done not because who we are at the core of our beings are inherently wrong, but because we are inherently ignorant. And we have confused the vehicle with the self. And so if I am my body, and I am its size, its shape, its color, its achievements, then I'm going to move through my world in jealousy, envy, competition with others who have better size, shapes, colors. I'm going to suffer when I don't feel that whether it's the size, the shape, the color, the race, the religion, is getting the respect that it should, operating in the way I'd like it to be, the same as those around me. So then there's conflict. So it creates suffering. Makes us constantly want more. So it leads to greed, leads to lust. It leads to all of these things when I'm identified just as this physical object. Leads to me feeling miserable about myself. I tried to do something. I couldn't do it. Wanted to achieve something. Couldn't achieve it. People around me treated me with great respect. I was happy. They didn't treat me with respect. I was miserable. So ultimately, it leads to suffering because it's ignorance. And then there's the Himalayan way of thinking, which is you have a body. It's wonderful, it's beautiful, whatever its size or shape or color or race or religion or culture or language may be. But it isn't you. You are the unchanging soul, spirit, consciousness, divinity, love, truth, whatever word we use. That is using this body as its medium for awakening. As the medium through which it interacts with the beautiful creation. So that's an arc that you all can take. And it's an arc that leads, I have seen personally as well as in so many, that leads to an end of suffering that is rooted in this is my identity. Because we carry it around with us. This is what happened to me. I was abused. I was abandoned. I was betrayed. I was cheated. I always get the short end of the stick. And we carry that through our lives. And then, of course, we create self-fulfilling prophecies so that we keep ensuring that we re-experience these because karmically we need to work through them. And the Himalayan way of thinking says, as my guru says so beautifully, focus a lot more on yourself than on your shelf. That instead of focusing so much on what you're going to fill your shelf with, the things we're going to buy and attain and obtain, focus on the fullness of the self. And it leads us into a space of fullness, of completeness, of wholeness, regardless of that which is happening in the world that we move through. Like the car might be stuck in traffic, but you as the driver are able to stay calm and anchored and centered and peaceful and joyful. In the same way, the body may be going through it challenging situation in the middle of a tough board meeting, being criticized, having the universe not act the way we want it to, maybe suffering loss, failure. But the you, as the one who inhabits the body, is able to stay anchored, grounded, in the fullness, in the completeness, in the perfection. 
And again, whether we say soul, spirit, consciousness, it doesn't matter. Thank you. you have a That's a beautiful teaching. Thank you. So we, we have a few questions in the chat, and I think we have a few questions in the room. So Janet on Zoom asks, how do you view or interact with other paths to experiencing the divine? For instance, other ashrams led by other gurus and other religious religions that do not speak the divine in a similar way. We love them. <laughs> and given our shortage of time and given the number of questions, I'm going to answer that question with just one simple analogy. In front of our ashram flows the beautiful river Ganga in which people bathe to get the blessings of the mother goddess, who is the, the one who has taken the form of this river, which is why the river is seen as so holy. But it doesn't matter how you get in. There's a lot of ways to get into that river. So you could go down the steps at our ashram. You could go down the steps at another ashram. You could go in off the sandy beach upriver. You could jump in off a rock. It's completely irrelevant. The goddess Ganga, who is blessing those who bathe in her waters, is not bestowing special blessings for those who do a you know, triple flip off the rock <laughs> upriver versus those who go in slowly from our steps. It doesn't matter. What matters is get in. And for us, what matters is connect to God. Whatever name, whatever form, whatever way you use, it's just another path into the same river. We're all going the same place. And it doesn't matter how you get there. All that matters is you get there. So anyone on that journey into the river of love, the river of oneness, the river of peace, we love them all. I enjoyed your story and your talk about feeling the oneness and feeling the soul awareness consciousness spirit underneath our skin suit. We all try to get there. We go in periods of consolation and desolation. Even the most practiced spiritual person has times when you just can't feel it. When you are there, when you can't get that feeling of being in the river or being with your guru or being um, even in a meditative state where you can feel your oneness and your spirit and your specialness, what's your go-to strategy or your go-to coping strategy until you can feel it again? Beautiful. So for me, my spiritual path has pretty much been one of creating spaciousness. And I think about it as an ocean. And so, for example, there are aspects in the book that share different challenges that I have gone through in India as a woman, particularly. And the answer to those challenges has always been, can I create enough space in myself in which this experience can also exist while my love and reverence for my femaleness also exists. That I don't have to buy into a system that has pushed me. But I also don't have to react against it. I don't have to have to actively reject it and fight against it. Instead, if I can expand my awareness such that, yes, that world also exists. And amazingly, it's even inhabited by people I respect deeply. And that it's not an either or, interestingly. And my love and my reverence for the very female body is full. And those are two things that don't go together very well. 
And the only way for me to be able to manage that internally, spiritually, is to expand the space so that it's not one or the other. And I think about it sometimes like I love the ocean. And I love to just float and merge into the ocean. And I've also got a bit of a phobia of sharks. And I try to do that in places of the ocean where there aren't sharks. <laughs> And the idea that there are sharks in the ocean, and yet here where I am is a space where there aren't sharks, but that I can go into the ocean even knowing that somewhere in the ocean they exist and it's the same ocean, is the same idea of spaciousness. In this ocean there are sharks, and in this ocean there is this opportunity for this experience. And in those moments when you don't feel it, or when you're struggling in so many ways. For me, again, it's always been about spaciousness, is okay. Can my spiritual experience actually expand to include this? So that it's not, I've got a spiritual experience and this is on the outside of it. But can my spiritual awareness and experience expand into a place where it's also okay to not feel God in that moment. Because I know God's there. I mean, I'm fully aware that the deficit is on my part, not God's part. And so can I, in compassion of myself, allow that spiritual experience to expand, to say, all right, and there are moments where the games of the mind are so much that they block me from the experience of the truth. Because that's what keeps us. It's not that the wind blows in the wrong direction. It's that we have gotten wrapped up in something that has actually kept us from feeling. And so that's the other piece of what I do, is I also then, if it tends to go on for a while, I really look at what is going on. In my mind, in my attention, in my intention, due to which my heart seems to have closed. Because in my spiritual experience, faith, belief, God is always there. And God doesn't play favorites. And God doesn't discriminate. And so if I take that with the experience of not feeling God in this moment, clearly I've done something. And that's okay, I'm human. But what is that? So that I can again open my heart to feel God. How did my curtain somehow get closed even though the day is so sunny? And how can I get them open again? Rather than sitting inside miserable that suddenly it's dark. Um, so I've been following you now for like about a year and I could cry just at your presence and I'm so thankful for this moment. Um, but my spiritual path has been something of, um, not something that's normal, I guess you could say. I was studying to be an ordained minister for about two years, um, and decided to kind of take a break from that. Um, and you, your meditations have just empowered me so much, um, and I feel like I'm a brand new woman um, over this past year, I would say this pandemic to really find my feet and my truth, um, remind myself of my worthiness, like you're saying, and um, all the things that you just share, you know, across Facebook pretty much. Um, <laughs> and all of your live meditations have been, I don't even know how to put it into words, um, all the way here in Connecticut throughout the brutal winters that we've have, you know, um, I rem I'm reminded of you just saying kind of like where you are, you know, is where God's at. Go outside and still experience, you know, the, the winters and the snow. And, you know, it really helped me um, to get through the winter and to still find my happiness. Um, and so I'm just so incredibly thankful that I found you. I don't even know how I found you, but it's, and then I saw you coming here today and I drove about an hour um, 
And it's just, it's something that I will always hold on to my heart. And I know that, you know, God always, ha he shows up in every time and we're supposed to be in this exact moment for this exact time with everybody here. And it's such a blessing. Um, so I'm just so thankful. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yep. Um, one quick question, I guess. I'm deciding to go back to school, um, actually, to be a, a registered dietitian, um, and I'm, you know, studying to kind of just help people understand the importance of plant-based and stuff, okay, you know, and, and focus on that. Um, so, with you know, growing up in the north and having the label of having like, um, let's say, a label of um, what is it? Comprehension issues, mm -hmm. we'll say, me as I'm growing up. Mm -hmm. um, how can I, say, overcome that um, and to step into this graduate program and, you know, enter this cycle again? Um, but, you know, how, wh what encouragement could, I guess, could you give me to help me, like, to really stay on the path and just to stay focused? Stop thinking that you have a comprehension problem. You don't seem to me like a woman with a comprehension problem. But it's so interesting how we carry these stories about ourselves. These beliefs that we have. That, you know, if you think about just doing this the other day, I'm teaching this online course on freedom. And we were just talking about these limiting beliefs this week. And if you ask yourself, okay, so this idea that I've got a comprehension problem. And all of us, if we go around, we won't, but if we did, we all would have some belief about ourselves that I'm lazy or I'm disorganized or I am not tenacious enough. I don't have what my mom used to call stick to <laughs> Or I'm not smart enough or I'm not gregarious enough. I'm too shy or I'm too fat or I'm too tall or too thin or too dark or too fair or whatever it may be. We've all got some belief, and in many cases, several of them, that are the reasons why we can't fill in the blank, find love, have the job we want, have the life we want, have the relationships we want, be in peace, be happy. And if you look back to where those came from, and it's a practice I highly recommend. We don't have time to actually go into it now, but I really recommend this. Go back, where did you learn that? When was the first time that you remember thinking that you were too fat, thin, tall, short, whatever it may be, or that you had this issue, this comprehension problem, or that you were lazy, or you were disorganized, or you weren't smart, or you didn't have stick to or you weren't... And in the vast majority of cases, because in the course we had everybody write into the chat where they learned it, and it was always either parents or teachers. Because all this stuff we get in our childhood. And then of course the next question is, and how old were your parents when you were born? And in the overwhelming majority of cases, it's somewhere in the 20s. Now you look at people in their 20s. They're babies. <laughs> <laughs> They're babies, right? I mean, not in, I don't mean that in a denigrating way. It's beautiful. But they're babies. But this idea that they are this omnipotent being who whatever comes out of their mouth is canon and should be carried for the next 80 years of our life as ultimate capital T truth. <laughs> Or our teacher who was, you know, going through a divorce and cranky and you know, whatever it may be. And we carry these, these moments of 
You're worthless. You're stupid. Why can't you be like your brother? What? And they go in. They go in literally like the ultimate truth. And then we carry them for decades and decades and decades. So I really recommend the process of look at them. Where did that come from? Who told you that? And in the vast majority of cases, we realize, oh my God, that isn't true. But what beliefs love is beliefs love to be true. So what it then does is it makes us literally self-sabotage as we move through our life just to uphold the belief, just to make us not have to look at the fact that maybe mom or dad wasn't right. They were doing their best with the toolbox that they had with whatever circumstances life handed them. But chances are they were some variation of scared, confused, worried, struggling in their own lives. Most of them had just gotten married. Most of them just started jobs. I mean, they're, they're kids. So as you move through this, every time that voice in you says, oh, I've got this problem, I want you to realize you don't. And by the way, having problems, we all have problems. We all have things we're good at, things we're not good at. But recognize that you have with you all of what you need to be present in this moment. And if the next moment is going to require new tools, you can learn them. And school is such a wonderful opportunity to do that. If you just said, oh, I need to know how to do this, you'll learn. Mm. Usually they're pretty good at giving you the tools as you go along. <laughs> okay, but there's no reason to walk out of school still convinced you have a comprehension problem. Don't, don't self-sabotage your life on the altar of upholding that belief. Sharon, how are we doing on time? Um, we are at, we're about an hour in. Uh -huh. I have one question in chat, and do, do you have a question as well? Oh, I wasn't sure if you were queuing up. Okay, so maybe we'll just take one last question. Yeah, I might have to ask another one, but. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so Rob on the Zoom asks, I think that the intersection of science and faith is a chasm where modern men and women struggle greatly. Do you feel this is true? It only... It only is a, a struggle. If, as I was saying earlier, we expect science to have the answers for everything. Otherwise, if we say, you know, science is really great at, for example, engineering this vehicle made of mostly steel and plastic that actually we can get in and is going to get us home in five minutes or ten minutes or an hour, but a lot faster than our legs would get there if we walked. I mean, I could sit here and meditate and try to bilocate and, you know, or I could try to do the Tabitha thing and, you know, try to, try to get myself home. But the amount of time it would take me, if ever, to develop a spiritual practice that enabled me to do that, compared to simply sitting in a car that science has created. In fact, there's a great story of my guru when he was young, there was a, another renowned leader, a yogi, who arrived at the ashram who could walk on water. And everybody came out to watch this man walk on water. And my guru was quite young at the time. But everybody who he met knew from his early, early childhood there was something very, very special. There is a very special spark here. And so he, he took my guru aside and said, you know, I will teach you. I can see that in you there is something. I will teach you this technique. And 
Puja Swamiji, my guru, said, well, how long did it take you? And how long? It was about 40 years. I've spent about 40 years doing this very special mantra, special practice. And Swamiji says, you know, there's this boatman, and for five rupees, he'll take me across the river <laughs> in a boat. And I would so much rather spend the next 40 years of my life doing something that benefits the world <laughs> rather than learning how to walk on water, but thank you so much. <laughs> and so there are places in which spirituality bows to science, right? I would much rather sit in a car than have to sit here and figure out how to levitate and move to the hotel. <laughs> much rather take a boat than spend 40 years trying to learn how to walk on water. And in terms of finding inner peace, in terms of finding real joy, real meaning in life, real purpose, connection to the divine, connection to myself. Well, I don't need science to tell me how to do it. Because that's what spirituality tells us. And science doesn't know how to do it. And that's fine. Because spirituality does. So as long as we don't expect them to be mirror images of each other, and we're able to see them as two different fields, two different ways of approaching life that in many cases overlap, and I love the places they overlap. I love when modern science discovers, invents something that you know, was written in the scriptures thousands of years ago. And it happens in quantum physics all the time these days. There'll be a discovery you know, just to give you one example, for example, you know, Newtonian physics talks about waves and particles. Then there's two different things. Things are either matter or they're energy. And then quantum physics starts to talk about, well, actually, sometimes waves behave like particles, sometimes particles behave like waves. And then recently, they've come up with something they call the observer effect, which quite literally means whether it's behaving like a wave or a particle depends on who's looking. And for science, I mean, this is, this is amazing. What do you mean? It's either a wave or it's a particle. How can the truth depend on who's looking at it? And yet, science now has discovered this. Well, spirituality has been telling us for thousands of years, you are creating your existence. You're creating your world. Your vision is actually creating the world that you occupy. How you see the world. There was a sign I actually saw on a, a church several years ago driving through America that said, watch your thoughts and you will see the future. So it's not just the Vedic spirituality. It's all of our spirituality. We are our thoughts. We are creating our world. So I love it when I get to say, well, and you know, science now is telling you that. But there shouldn't be suffering. There should be a space that we say, all right, this is the jurisdiction of spirituality. This is the jurisdiction of science. And I wouldn't ask spirituality to get me from point A to point B physically. And I wouldn't ask science to get me from point A to point B spiritually or emotionally. And that's okay. It's wonderful, in fact. Hmm. Is there another question? So um, I picture this, this young woman standing uh, next to Mother Ganga, and she has this incredible moment. And instead of being from LA, uh, she's the local village girl. Um, 
in India, uh, is she just another girl who had a moment that, oh yeah, it's one out of every you know, 50 people here who have this moment, yeah, great, yeah, follow it and have a good life, you know, mm -hmm. all the rest of it. Why do you think, if you can speak to this briefly, why an American goes and has this experience and it, it brings back so much to the West when that young girl there is, yeah, we all have it. It's great, enjoy it. Why? Thank you. Sure, I think culturally, and this is, you know, one of the great blessings in my life is this opportunity to be a bridge between the cultures. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of Indians. I mean, if you survey the people who come to our beautiful lighting ceremony every night, the Arati, and you survey them afterwards, and you say, how do you feel? Well, not even one out of every 50. It's much more likely to be one out of every five is going to start to cry as they tell you the experience that they've had in that ceremony. And of course, it may not be exactly like the experience I had. Everybody's spiritual experience is different. But I think because I came from this world, because the experience was so unexpected for me, and because of the culture that I was raised in, and the juxtaposition, see for Indians, having that experience doesn't create the, oh my God, what has just happened to my life. It's right in line with everything they've always thought, everything they've been taught, everything they believe, everything everyone around them has always said. Whereas for me, the experience undid everything I had always thought or believed, everything anyone around me had ever told me. And so it brought me into a space of a brand new way of living in which I found that healing and that transformation. And with that excitement, realizing how this culture, to a large extent, has been raised the way I was raised, with the thoughts the way I have them, with patterns the way I had them. And what a great blessing it is to be able to share these possibilities with people for whom they're not part of their culture. So, yeah, I think that's, you know, in the beginning I used to think, God, I should have just been born in India. Like, that would have just been so much easier. And as, as the years have gone by, I realized, no, the universe knew exactly what it was doing because I needed to have, A, the experience of trauma that I did, and B, the experience of opportunity and privilege that I did, to be able to both understand and then speak to the world that needs it. Well. I think we should probably stop the questions on that note. Um, there's so much in this book, uh, it's really would be impossible to uh, cover all the insights that you share and, and have well, made. Well, it took me 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and made accessible to us. Um, so just scratching the surface with you tonight has been such a great blessing to us. Thank you so very much uh, for joining us. Um, and I would like to spend just a little bit of time in silence, if everyone is game, um, with Sadhvi. So sure. let's move into that for a bit. And please, if you can, just remain <coughs> seated while we go there. If you're not in the mood to meditate, just take a nap. Um, we'll wake you up, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> do you want to just sit in silence, or do you want me to do a guided, guided meditation? Which would you prefer, silence or guided meditation? Guided? <laughs> I was going to say silence, so I'm glad I asked. 
I, I would prefer still. <laughs> well, let's see if we can find the silence in the guided. Just take a moment and allow, allow yourself to move inward. The eyes are already closed. And you can imagine your, your sense of sensation and perception as those old dog ear antennas that we used to have on TV sets that usually are pointed out into the world around us, picking up all the sights and sounds and sensations. But now take those antennas and shift them inward. And allow yourself to just experience what it is like right here, right now, in this And draw the awareness to the breath. Don't try to change it, but just allow the awareness to merge with your breath as it flows in and flows out, like the gentle waves of the ocean. And allow that awareness of the breath, instead of being anchored in your chest or your rib cage, drop the awareness of the breath down as low in your abdomen as you can. There's a beautiful energy center just about two inches below your belly button. Allow yourself to be aware of the breath from that energy center. Inhaling and exhaling from that place low in the abdomen. And if the mind wanders, don't worry. Just bring it back. Don't judge. Don't get caught up in the story. Just allow the awareness to come back to the breath.
And as you exhale, allow yourself to really let go. With each exhalation, allow yourself to let go of another role that you play. Another mask that you wear. Another identity that you hold on to. An expectation. An aspect of your history a pain or a grudge, just let them go. As you exhale, allow yourself to just breathe them back out into the universe, back to Mother Earth. And as you exhale and let go, allow yourself to sink deeper and deeper into that core of the self. Into that place within that source of love, of peace, of joy. Sinking deeper and deeper, freer and freer on each exhalation, as you sink into that true core of the self. Slowly and gently, bring the palms of your hands together at chest level and rub them gently against each other. Press the palms of your hands into your closed eyes. Slowly and gently, 
Lower your hands and up and around. It's a joy to be with you all this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. It's been a wonderful evening for us. We don't want to leave this space right now. And we don't have to. <laughs> oh. So... Um, gosh, the thank yous must go all the way around. Uh, there's so many people who worked so hard to uh, get us all together tonight, and many of them have name tags on in the room. Um, I just really want to thank from the bottom of my heart um, all the volunteers who have been working so hard since really last April, May to put together the set of programs that are going to be offered by the Spiritual Center, this being the first of the fall and spring seasons. Um, we uh, also are very blessed to have had uh, the generous support of a number of, of donors um, for our programs and also for the refurbishment of this hall. And so I'd like to acknowledge all the contributions that were made uh, by our parishioners in order to create this space here for us to enjoy. Um, and, um, and then a big thank you again to Sadi for this remarkable evening that we've had with you. Um, thank you so much. Joined in a few uh, weeks, Matthew Wright, uh, a young contemplative um, who is an Episcopal priest and also a Sufi practitioner, will be um, offering a Zoom uh, focused on uh, heart-centered uh, prayer as we know it from the desert fathers and mothers. And that'll be uh, on September 26th. Then we also will have, following him, a wilderness guide who taught uh, survival skills at Dartmouth for 15 years, um, who is also deeply practiced in centering prayer, will be doing a workshop for us on a Zoom um, in early October. Uh, and then um, we will have a conversation about um, the challenges of the dominance-based culture of, of, of masculinity that um, surrounds us, something that Savi touched on in her comments and, and one that we really do need to grapple more deeply with, and that'll be on October 23rd. So mark your calendars for that. That should be in the brochure that was handed out. And uh, wow, <laughs> let's sign some books. <laughs> What a joy that was, really.